I think each regional country is so different. So I think Mm -hmm. first piece of advice, don't assume all of the Middle East is the same. Welcome to the show, Lucy. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Kelly. I'm so happy. I feel like we've kind of gone full circle because you were in my very first book in 2000. And I think I interviewed in 2008, 2009. And I always remember one story in it. And I'm going to touch on that in just a minute. But for those that are listening and watching, can you give everyone a little bit of a background as to who you are and what you do? Sure. I'll try and keep it short. (laughs) My name's Lucy Darbo. Um, I'm the founder of Together, which is a dedicated workplace culture consultancy. Mm -hmm. I've spent my whole life in the Middle East and Africa. So I was born in Sudan, moved to the UAE in 1982. So and been here ever since, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I've seen so much change. And I think the kind of entrepreneurial spirit of the UAE rubbed off, because I'm a well now called a serial entrepreneur yeah and that's kind of how we met the first time we were brought together I co-founded a consultancy with my sister in 2004 Mm -hmm. around integrated communications PR events etc and then we spent kind of 15 years building that and we were acquired by the world's largest PR agency in 2015 so it was quite a journey yeah exited that business and then Mm -hmm. some say I'm mad but I've started it all again with the new baby in my life I suppose which is our new business together. Did you think when you saw that was it and you wouldn't start again? So that was very much the headspace. My sister and I used to laugh. You know, Nike has the phrase, just do it. We used to say, we're going to write a book and call it just don't, don't, don't do, do it, it. <laughs> because once we would you know once that moment had passed I, yeah I really felt like okay been there done that you know got the t-shirt have been through all that roller coaster and yeah, yeah it's done now yeah and so how long was that sort of from selling to you deciding to do it all again well that's a great question so we sold in 2015 I left in 2017 mm-hmm. and then launched together in 2022 yeah yeah or end of 2021 even not long actually that's quite scary I've never thought about it that way (laughs) you know that was a process exiting the business in itself Mm. was quite a big pivotal moment in my both personal and and professional career but then coming to the decision to do it all again was pretty quick I'm a pretty determined character. I remember that from interviewing you and your sister back in 08 and 09 for the book um, Dubai Success Stories and telling everyone about the entrepreneurial journey then you know so you started in 2004 mm. I started my business in 2005 it really was kind of the the beginning of women in business I, I would say because it wasn't massive then what was your sort of take on it then? Oh no you're right I mean there was so few entrepreneurs I suppose because the landscape was very new Mm. and I think if I'm not wrong Dubai free zones media city and the like only opened around that time yeah and coincidentally we actually took a call not to be in a free zone back in 2004 because we felt it was more credible to be onshore because it was all such a new thing and people were all but still a bit suspicious yeah and then fast track to now when you know we have what more than a dozen free zones and so many entrepreneurs across the UAE it's just phenomenal to see that yeah I've always loved when we've spoken you've always been really honest talking about business we've, we've done webinars together during COVID and even when I interviewed you and your sister I always remember this story that you told me I'm slightly worried I don't don't know what's coming no I remember you told me when you had signed it was one of your very first clients and you got into the lift and then you both looked at each other and then you jumped up and down on the lift it was like we signed the client and I just remember you telling me that whole story do you remember yeah yeah Yeah. I mean vividly and I remember you telling me that and I was like I felt like I was with you on that it just felt so real and you know the whole perspective it's not easy running a business and when you sign that first client or you sign the big client like it is let me have the little happy dance and that just made it all very relatable to me who was someone who was new starting out so with that kind of personal brand piece because I don't you wouldn't know at the time that you're creating the relatability is that something that you've always brought through the business and what you do being very transparent and everything Mm, absolutely and I think um a little bit like many things in my life it didn't start intentionally so I don't think we thought we were building a personal brand you know we're going back 20 odd years it wasn't a thing but what became clear very quickly is that sticking to your values and what matters most to me has Mm -hmm. been a, a running theme throughout 
my personal and professional life. Yeah. And I think back then it was part of why we set up the business was this real desire for quality work. Mm -hmm. And that has retained with me forever, but also about being kind of credible and, and not being one of those all talk and no action. You know, I'm a grafter naturally, and I've been very fortunate that hard work has paid off for me. Yeah. And I've always felt like that's been kind of what then my personal brand has kind of been associated with. Authentic, mm -hmm. reliable, you know, yeah. I, I value reliability very highly and I therefore deliver on that. How do you bring that into a team? Because I know it's something that a lot of people that I certainly start to work with go, well, I've, I've got a big team, but people buy into you. Because people buy people they know, like, and trust. How do you then maintain the same not the same standards of personal brand because everyone's got their own personality but those same values I guess to me that's really what the foundation of all of it is it's being really clear about what your values are mm -hmm. whether that's personally or professionally mm -hmm. and then making sure that you're clear about what that means in terms of actions yeah. so if I say authenticity is a really important value what does that look like in action so mm -hmm. how do I demonstrate that and that makes it really tangible and that's really where my culture work started because when my sister and I co-founded Darbo and Co, many in 2004, our culture was really well known within the industry. And that was what people were coming, you know, why they wanted to work with us. And that started very much as her and I's sisters and family values that we'd both grown up with. Mm -hmm. And those kind of led our decision making, integrity, transparency, all of these kind of core values that were because we were related and sisters. We then realized very soon, actually, we have to be really explicit about it. But how powerful is that when people understand what values matter most and can then kind of act in a way that mirrors that mm -hmm. so that you're all working towards one goal. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's always stood so, so true to me that yeah. you must stand behind what you do. And I think as a leader, never more important in a world where there is so much uncertainty, being credible and reliable and doing what you say you're going to do, which seems so simple and basic. It does, yeah. But yet so few seem to be able to deliver on that. You Why know. do you think people can't deliver on that then? I think people get really lost in wanting to say the right thing mm. or kind of kind of tell people what they want to hear. Because one of the hardest things about leading a group of people is having to have the difficult conversations. Yeah. And everyone focuses so much on the great news and the good stuff that's happening. But the reality is, if, and you know yourself, not every day is a rosy day. Mm. And how do you navigate and unify a group of people behind one common goal through the good, the bad, the ugly? Because that's the inevitability of life, right? We just don't know what's around the corner. When the business sale happened, and, and sort of just to touch on that, the personal brand piece, as much as, you know, businesses obviously look for the equity within the business, how much do you think your personal brand and your sisters and what you'd built played a part in one of the biggest buyouts. What's your thoughts on that? At the time, I don't think we realized at all. Yeah. And it's, hindsight's a wonderful thing when we look back. You know, sometimes you're so busy doing and working so hard. I don't, we didn't spend an awful lot of time going, look at us. Yes, we had those moments in the lift where every win, <laughs> you know, and I think that's always, you have to celebrate every victory. Yeah. And that's part of what I think is so important in a team environment. You know, celebrate the wins. You've got to make time for that because that's why we all want to do what we do and, and acknowledge the great work. I think without realizing it, we had built quite a reputation. And mm -hmm. I think being sisters and women in an emerging part of the world did stand us in very good stead. And, uh, you know, at the time, a lot of the media was new. There was a lot more publications coming out, both in the UAE and the region. Yeah. And therefore, we kind of presented quite a compelling story. So that, that created a lot of interest. And although we didn't seek it out, I'm very naturally a very, very private person. And I tend to steer away. Ironically, most people find that hard to believe. But, you know, those opportunities presented themselves and you kind of can't look a gift horse in the mouth. How do you overcome that? Because I think that's a really valid point that so many people say to me at networking events and in any opportunity, I'm, I'm quite shy or I'm naturally reserved, but they know that they need to put themselves out there. And I know that you maybe had a little bit of armor with your sister as well. So there was two of you in it. But was it knowing that it was right for the business or was it that you just had to get on with it or was it finding ways that 
you were comfortable with? What sort of strategies worked for you in that sort of more reserved space? 10, 15 years ago, it was really, really hard. And to be honest, I still find it really hard. But what I know now is that today you can't not do it. Mm. And I have to accept that. And launching a new business in this era, if you get the invitation, take it. And therefore, there's a lot of self-talk of kind of going, look, if I want this business to succeed and I'm a direct connection to that brand so personally I need to build my own brand Mm -hmm. you have to just put yourself forward hold on tight and do it and actually they say you know practice makes perfect yeah you've got to keep doing it and I remember the first podcast I was invited on I can't tell you how terrified I was you know and I still get nervous and (laughs) But, but you know, sitting here now, you wouldn't know that. You like very, but that's the whole thing. I think people cut, will look at you and what you're doing, thinking, "Gosh, she's totally got this in the bag." It's, Whereas that's more recent. Well, if you were saying business 2021, this past sort of two or three years, you've had to then put yourself out, and you don't have your sister in the same space that you did first time around. It's really hard. It's hard because what I know is to rely on the work. So you know my historical professional record has always been delivery you know being reliable delivering great quality these are the things that really matter to me you know to be pioneering market leading award winning these are all because that's about the greatness of the work Mm -hmm. it's not about me as an individual and that's where I find it challenging and I'm sure a lot of people do because I'm very very comfortable to stand and sell my work Mm -hmm. but it's very difficult to stand and sell oneself, right? Yeah. Because that's kind of putting yourself out there. And, and what that means is there's risk. My fear is, you know, what are they going to say or the judgment or all the things that can come with that. And actually, it's much easier to stay and just head down and just work really, really hard and deliver great work and know that that will take you so far. The reality is today, it won't be enough. Yeah. And so you've got to kind of take a deep breath and just believe that it's the right thing to do and keep doing it. And it does get easier. Yeah. I can say that for sure. It's definitely not natural, but every time gets easier. I often say to clients, when you're thinking about yourself, it becomes from a place of fear. But then when you start thinking about the value that you're bringing or the opportunities to support other people that don't know, when you start thinking about them, then the fear diminishes a little bit. And then it's less about you. It's like, actually, I've got something that I can help people with. And I think if you're doing a disservice by Mm. not actually putting yourself in a space to be able to help someone or support someone in what they're going through, whatever your niche is in that whole space. But is there not a little bit in the business that you're in now, that personal brand, together, cultures, workplace, it's about people. That then comes down to Mm. each of them have their own personal brand. So talk me a little bit about the business that you're doing now. Just to touch on that is so ironic, because if I think about all the people that I've worked with and the teams I've led and the individuals I've mentored, and that's one of the things that gives me the most reward and most enjoyment through work is the incredible people you get to work with. And I'm in professional services, so we don't have, you know, we're not selling mugs or phones or, or creating. It's very much people focused. And my mentoring has always been focused on, you know, think of yourself as a brand. When people talk about you, what do they say? And the irony was for all those years, that's what I was helping my team to develop, yeah. but not doing it for myself. <laughs> I'm sure you're not alone in that space as well. No, no, when it comes to the kind of work that I do at Together, we're really looking at kind of workplace culture. And essentially that is for everybody. One of the things I always remind people is that a workplace culture is a team sport. It's not one individual. It's about everyone contributing. And if everyone's contributing to it in the right direction and with the same values, Mm -hmm. we touched on that earlier, then there will be a really distinctive culture that can be developed. But each person has to contribute to it. It's not just the CEO or just the HR team. It is about everyone in the organisation contributing. Is there a a definitive timeline and how you can actually improve the workplace? Does it depend on the size of the organization? I mean, I know it's something that you end up doing forever, but how do you start to get into that and put a timeline in it? Well, it it all depends, like you said. No two organizations are the same. No two cultures are the same. It's a bit like DNA. If you and I were, you know, at face value, looked exactly the same. But actually, when you look at the DNA, we're completely, completely unique. And it's kind of made up of a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So a culture in an organization, it's 
considered around kind of how did the performance, so how does the organization perform both financially, but also how do teams perform together? How do colleagues work mm -hmm. one on one? Is it effective? Is it ineffective? We look at reputation, mm -hmm. which is very specifically links to that whole brand piece. Yeah. What are people saying about the organization, both in the media, but also peer to peer? Yeah. So are teams recommending this is a place to come and join and work? Or are they saying, do not come and work here? Trust me, you know, go anywhere but here. Then look at engagement. Are the workforce engaged? Do they have everything they need? Do they know what they're doing? Do they know what they need to do? And then finally, we look at purpose. Do they know what the company values most? Do they know what the vision is? Where is this organization trying to go? And, and how are they going to get there? And when you look at all those considerations, it helps you understand what the state of play is today. People get lost in what's a good and a bad culture. Mm -hmm. To me, it's not good or bad. It's Is it working for that organization? Are people and performance both delivering? Then it's successful organization. Is it for everyone? Would everyone go into that business and say, yes, I want to work here? Hopefully not, because it should be very the right distinctive mm. to what the business is trying to do. And that's where it's slightly unique. Your culture should enable the business strategy. That's the core to it. In the personal branding, I always say everyone has a personal brand. It's just you might not actively be working on it. Does everyone have a culture? Yes. Ah. Whether they like it or not, yes. it's there. Ah. So one of the questions we always ask, particularly a C-suite or mm -hmm. a board, when they're talking about their company, and sort of say, give them each a post-it note and a pen and mm -hmm. ask them to describe the culture. So imagine I was a prospective interviewee and I ask you to describe the culture in your organization. And let's say there's 10 of them around the table. Each one writes down quietly, right? It's a secret. Mm -hmm. What they would describe. And then we take them and we pin them up. And nine times out of 10, there's 10 different versions, which means it's not clear and distinctive, but it has a lot of mini cultures, let's say. Uh. And therefore, what's core to performance and success is alignment. Everyone should be aligned in what it is we're trying to achieve and what we stand for, what matters most. And that's really where the work begins, honestly. Have you had one where you've gone, oh, wow, it's been one extreme to the other within the organization? Oh, yeah, always. I mean, some organizations are more complex than others. So we're working with organizations that might have a very, very low culture score, which just means there's no alignment. So you've got pockets okay. of different departments will be doing different things or different so levels. They might be quite happy or... In their own silo, yes. but the organization as a whole is not aligned and moving in the same direction. Mm. Then you have other ones that are actually much more effective and yeah. aligned, but their performance isn't going to be to the same success you know and they're wanting to deliver more or deliver more on numbers mm -hmm. so it is oddly very very unique to each organization and it takes time yeah. I think as you said it is ongoing yeah but a kind of full culture transformation which would be you know from one end to the other which we normally do over three phases can take 18 months to two years okay. to complete a full transformation how would someone know that they've maybe got a culture problem or or that they just maybe need to improve on it The great thing is, and that's the joy of this type of work, yeah. most people that are coming to us know they want support. Yeah. Whether they're actually having what we call a toxic culture and they need to go for a full transformation, or sometimes they have a really, really good culture, but they want to do more. They need mm. to invest in it. And more often than not, in that case, it will be that they're about to go through some major change. Yeah. So if we, what we see regularly, it's people coming out of mergers, acquisitions, or either going through large, fast-paced growth, growth or regional distributions, they're going into new markets, mm -hmm. or indeed new CEO, new C-suite. Generally, this comes through change. I would love it to be not always required because yeah. of that. But look, it's new. This is a new market. It's, yeah. a, it's a new industry. So that's great that people are recognizing it. And I think what's most comforting is more often than not, it's coming at board level. Yeah. So the board is recognizing the need for it, which to me is the best news ever, because if they can recognize it, even if it's giving a gentle nudge to the business, at least it's starting that. Because it really is, it's a movement. Yeah. For me. Which stays with the organization. Yeah. And that's, I think, where people misunderstand, and certainly leaders. Culture is a movement. It's not a mandate. You can't enforce it on people. Yeah. And that's why I say it's a team sport. It's not about one person working tirelessly. It's about uniting a group of people behind a common goal with shared values. And that's when it becomes a superpower.
What are some of those examples of great culture? There are so many. Where yeah. you start to see the results, and I think that's where it becomes really interesting, is what is the data that backs up that it makes sense? Because yeah. a lot of people are quite cynical and mm-hmm. they're like, what is it? You know, the myth that a great culture is a foosball table and some bean bags <laughs> and yoga on Friday. And it's so not that. Okay. Those are great, nice to have. Yeah. But putting a foosball table, I don't think is ever proven to change a culture. <laughs> What's worse often I've seen is where people put in the foosball table, but the CEO doesn't want anyone to play it because he's much keener that they sit at their desks and work all day. So it's nothing to do with that. It's really the core of it is alignment. And I talk about mm-hmm. it a lot, but that is the core of it. If you asked 10 people and you picked them one by one from a business and asked them to describe the culture, you would get a similar answer. Mm. If you ask them, what is the vision? What are we all working towards? There would be either exactly correct or very similar. That is the ultimate success. But really at the core of it, recognition is one of the number one factors around building a really strong culture where you have people that feel recognized for Mm -hmm. their work, not financially, Yeah, because often I've read a lot about that, that financially it's not always the biggest driver. No, because look, in the end, you could be paid more money than any other job, but be Be utterly miserable. miserable. And I think, look, where we are today after everything we've been through in the last Mm -hmm. three years, there is a universal shift that actually that's not enough. Mm -hmm. You know, we all were put through so much stress and questioning our life choices through COVID now, it's really, we've seen a real change where the workforce now have more power and are deciding Mm -hmm. the kind of organizations they want to work in. And more often than not, in the top three questions of interviewees, one of them will be around remuneration and Mm -hmm. salary, and one will absolutely be around culture. What about the whole work from home? Oh, Uh, it's a hot topic. Is it? What is it? Because I've I've spoken to so many people that are like, I don't want to go back to working or I do want to go to the office place. And my fiance's just moved to the Middle East. And the big thing for him was he didn't want to be in the office every day. That was really a deal breaker for him, more than the money. Yeah. So what's your thoughts on that? Well, you're kind of fascinating, right? Because I think you've always worked from home one way or another. Yeah. So you were like well ahead of the game. (laughs) It's um, from our perspective, and certainly me personally, I am all for radical change. I believe that we find the right solution for the right situation. Mm. And I certainly don't come from a generation, like my eldest is nearly 17. Mm -hmm. I've got three kids. The idea that they would have to work the way I did just because I did it, just makes Doesn't make me, sense. I, 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 it incenses me because yeah. I just don't understand why we would want to enforce the next generation to live the life that we did when so many of us were like, I don't know how I did it. And I, I personally don't know how I did it. When I had three children under five and I was working 15 Full-time. hour days, mm-hmm. sometimes six or seven days a week, how I didn't end up having some sort of I mean, who knows? So I really believe that with the right structure and in the right business and for the right people, working from home is a really powerful solution. I think the key is hybrid is the answer. But what that looks like is dependent totally on the organization. But what we do know is that we can see better productivity. There is evidence to back up that productivity, that engagement, Mm -hmm. satisfaction for the workforce and for people is higher. The tragic thing is that normally it's managers that dictate whether we can or we can't and they often don't have the skills to manage in a more sophisticated way Mm, particularly in our region like we're very task oriented you know so manager to employee it tends to be one task at a time and we're used to people sitting next to us saying can you do that and then they come up done that okay now do this Ah. hybrid that doesn't work yeah so what really works with hybrid is really exceptional management skills where you're giving people longer running projects you're giving them more space to kind of manage their own time and empower them Mm -hmm. and you're checking in at regular intervals that takes time to learn Mm -hmm. we have a lot of managers who haven't been upskilled so it's not their fault ultimately you need to have have the skills to be able to know how to lead in that context so that can be one of the challenges we're seeing and trust is at the center of it Mm. every time you speak to someone who's not comfortable with the concept it tends to be because they think someone's at home you know filing their nails and watching you know Netflix (laughs) Netflix. (laughs) and there's a then that's a deep trust issue yeah and a really good culture and a really good manager, trust is at the core of that. 
Well, I think then that kind of pivots back to the whole personal brand piece, because I think if you've been building that personal brand, the trust comes with that. So that is down to employees. A lot of CEOs and and organisations are actually scared to invest in their employees' personal brand. But if they do, then that trust piece comes and the bigger picture all kind of comes together. But it's actually interesting because I have worked from home for a huge number of years, but I'm loving going into co-working spaces. Are you? Yeah, I really do find that having that once or twice a week, the change, the energy, I really love it. So I, I do see the hybrid. And look, we're social creatures. Mm. We're social animals. We're hardwired to find our tribes, to be yeah. social you know, all the time. So absolutely, being away from the office and isolated is not necessarily the right answer. Mm -hmm. I think where you see a lot of pushback is where people feel they're forced to go into an office to do exactly what they would be doing at home, and yet it's taken them three hours of commuting. (laughs) And, you know, there are so many unique scenarios where people would just really prefer to put their time elsewhere and be Mm -hmm. more productive in other things. In the end, what time will tell? And I think what we'll see in the next couple of years will be a real settling of this debate. And the organisations that nail it will be great case studies for others to follow. That's really interesting. What are some of the most valuable lessons you've learned Mm. and taken with you to your, your new baby? Gosh, so many. How long have you got? Yeah, (laughs) don't know how long have we got. (laughs) It's interesting doing it again because you're kind of, you know, wisdom's a wonderful thing. Hindsight gives you 20, 20 vision, Mm -hmm. but also it's a new industry and it's a new world. It's, you know, 20 years later after setting up the first one. So the world has changed. And even pre and post COVID, especially in what you do. So it's very different. It has been a lot. I had an executive coach many years ago now and it was Mm -hmm. transformational for me. And I think that whole personal brand piece connects to it until you can have really strong self-awareness it's very hard to be able to do you know change evolve and develop yourself Mm -hmm. one of the greatest quotes that he told me and I've kept always is Einstein's theory of insanity doing the same thing over and over (laughs) and expecting a different outcome and that I have used in every context every day since because we are so often do these things and we're like why is it not working why have things not changed and actually if you take a step back most of the time we haven't done anything differently yeah and we're just you know doing the same thing and getting absolutely nowhere and I've really found that to be such a useful kind of compass for me Mm -hmm. because every time I feel like I'm stuck or something's not working or we've hit a bit of a brick wall I'm always taken back to that quote to consider a different route or a different way of looking at it. And it's proved to be super helpful. That quote was the one that made me think about moving my Instagram page. I recently launched a new Instagram page and thank you, you're one of my new followers (laughs) because for the past 12 years, I had the same account. I was doing, was providing great value, great quality content. I was posting regularly. I was doing the same thing. But I was expecting a different result Mm -hmm. and I wasn't. And that's when I was like, okay, when you look at everything, I've got to try something different and the different things. And I'm doing exactly what I was doing on my page. Nothing's changed with the content, but it's Mm, back to that pace. Yeah, but it's back to expecting something else to change. It's a great reminder. What's next for you in the business and what you're doing? Because you grew your business, it was big. It what was. was your big team that you got up to? By the time we were acquired, we were in over 85, all self-funded and kind of organically grown over a decade. So yeah. particularly in our industry as well, which is professional services as well, consulting, but so much excitement. I mean, I think the landscape here, there was a lot of cynics again this time around with Together and workplace culture and a lot of people telling me nobody would buy it, who would pay for that. The region has just, the appetite's incredible. So Mm -hmm. the growth has been pretty fast, pretty quick, which is a fantastic problem to have, but that presents its own challenges. You know, I think as a self-funded business, it can be really hard to balance, you know, growth, scale, managing cash flow all at once. So that's a fun challenge at the moment. Yeah. We're going to be moving into Saudi officially. We have a lot of um, mm. clients in Saudi. So we're very regional, UAE's home. We've got clients in Saudi and Kuwait, actually. Mm-hmm. Having a proper presence there is is our target by the end of next year. So what's that give me? Like 14, 15 months. So it's ambitious, yeah. but I'm determined. And growing the team. We've got a whole new um, bunch of people joining, collaborators across the region. Yeah. So there's a lot of fun stuff. And our first event we're going to be doing our first thought leadership event so I'm really excited for that okay 
because really the more people you can get talking about workplace culture and, and giving people tools to be able to impact their own mm -hmm. that is what makes me happy just a thought on that because i know people are listening and they might be thinking themselves oh i'm interested to go to saudi or kuwait or branch into to other markets so what would be your thoughts mm. for other people thinking about that i mean how are the connections coming to you i'd love to know a little bit more about yeah that. no totally i think each regional country is so different so i think mm -hmm. first piece of advice don't assume all of the middle east is the same yeah okay. and that can be a common issue right in this regional people coming into it assume yeah. that the ua is the same as bahrain and so on and it's absolutely not um with saudi arabia you really need to have really strong network on the ground mm. it's very complicated it's an enormous country and it's changing so rapidly that what was true six months ago won't be true today yeah. so having really good contacts go and visit don't make assumptions from being far away i think yeah. we can all too often it's actually stems from the working from home people are just not going out anymore you have to go visit your market get to know it understand where your audience might be and whether or not it will work just because something works in the uae doesn't mean it it's will work, work there everywhere else so yeah definitely knowing people on the ground and really uncover the kind of legislation because it is so so different mm. the tax in kuwait is different to the uae there's just a lot of red tape so go to market get some connections and do some really really it's thorough good. research yeah yeah well i wish you the best of luck with everything before we go a few fun questions to ask you we've got some cards in the middle here okay. um would you like to pick a couple and answer away take two yeah so what do we have you haven't okay. lucy hasn't seen any of these <laughs> I'm tempted to break my own rules when it comes to running a business. <laughs> Tell me one rule that you've broken. I'll always say, let's be radical. You know, so if someone says we should do it this way, you go, why? Why do we have to do it that way? Like, uh, let's do it differently. Mm -hmm. There's no, you know, I think the rule book's out. There is, yes, infrastructural stuff you have to do. But if you want to be different or pioneering in an industry, you've got to try something new. Just because everyone else did it one way doesn't mean... It's the only way. And it's back to your quote. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I genuinely love it. Love that. I wish I could spend more money on where to start. <laughs> Actually, on my business. Do yeah. you know what? I think if I had, because it is self-funded, right? If mm. I had more cash, I would absolutely put more in. What would you spend it on then? Money brings people and scale. We're in a people business. Yeah. So if I could hire you know, 10 more consultants instead of another three. Yeah. That would enable us to get from startup to running yeah. much faster. And my big ambition, obviously, is to make workplace culture the norm and not the exception. So the more people we've got doing it on the ground across the region, the more change we could have. I love it. Yeah. That's a perfect way to end. Thank you so much. I wonder where we'll be. What was that, 2008, 2009? So what, nearly 14 years. Where will we be another 14 years from now? hopefully retired happy living with a beautiful palm view you, in the marina do you think that you'll ever retire yeah i think that's a whole nother podcast <laughs> probably not i love it thank you so much for your time thanks kelly it's been brilliant